Yeah, I do speak now, so you cannot hear me. Can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? Now, can you hear me? Can you hear me now? So now you can... Okay. So now you can hear me. Okay. So it seems I have to speak closer to the microphone. Uh, yeah, I was born in Bosnia and I grew up in Bosnia. I finished my primary and secondary school in Bosnia and I was a child when there was a war. So probably that's the main reason why I decided to work in education sector in conflict and post-conflict societies. I was always involved in some kind of civil uh, civic activism. I was volunteering for different NGOs. My first job was in um, NGO 
uh, as a program assistant in on education project. And then I decided to do my master's degree in education in the UK at the university. Uh, okay, there is a second question. So then you'll bring up. Uh, so what can I recall from the war? Many things. Um, yeah, it really depends in which part of Bosnia you lived during the war period. In my hometown, there was not so much killing or bombing, but people were hungry. Uh, so the worst thing that I've seen or experienced, actually, as I said, there was I haven't seen anybody uh, die from my family or neighbors. It was just that when the war started, um, I didn't realize, but there was nobody to go to school with suddenly in, in, in a few weeks because all of my neighbors, all of my kids that I used to play with, they escaped to other countries. And then maybe after the second year of four, there was a false information that there are terrorists coming to kill us in the part of the city where I used to live. So me and my family, we had to uh, run in the middle of the night, uh, deep in the forest. And my grandfather, he was sick at that day, so he, he didn't want to leave his home. And he said, if they will kill me, I prefer to die in my own house. So I remember we didn't know if next day or ever again, if we are going to see grandfather alive. So probably that's the scariest experience that I had during the war. The cause of the war, um, that's a difficult question. Nobody knows the answer to this question. There are so many, um, so many reasons, so many explanations. But in a wider geopolitical uh, uh, frame, it was a collapse of Soviet Union. Uh, Yugoslavia back then was a communist country. Um, all the post-Soviet countries, they wanted to get independence, nationalism on the rise. Um, being independent, having your own, own country uh, at that period meant that finally you will be able to, as we used to call it, eat from the golden spoon, which means there will be prosperity for everybody, at least that's what our politicians told us. Uh, and most of the people started believing these ideas. Uh, media was very powerful, all this propaganda that was coming from the centers of powers. And um, they were playing with the people's feelings, identities. And for some reason, which is still mysterious to me, uh, neighbors started turning against each other. People who used to live for decades, centuries next to each other, drink coffee every morning, go to school with marrying family members. They decided that they will trust their political leaders, whom they never met other than on TV, and that their neighbor, who is a different, uh, who has a different religious background or national background, is suddenly a threat to a neighbor. So the war started, killing started, and as probably most of you know, genocide. Uh, first uh, genocide after the Second World War in uh, Europe, which happened in a small city called Srebrenica. So, uh, so as I said at the beginning, it really, uh, it really uh, depends on which place in uh, Bosnia and Herzegovina you lived. In during the war, uh, my hometown, which is in central part of Bosnia, not very far away from Sarajevo, from capital, there was not so much bombing uh, or killing there, but we were hungry because the city was besieged and uh, there was a huge heavy metal industry in my hometown which stopped working during the war so suddenly you would have tens of thousands of people unemployed and all the other um, uh, parts of the economy which were linked to this heavy metal industry were not working and simply traveling was impossible import export of the food uh, my sister she was born in 1990 and i remember when there was 
um, just after the war ended, uh, we bought bananas, and of course I remember what banana is and uh, from from the period before the war. But my sister didn't know how to eat banana. She thought uh, banana is eaten without peeling the skin. Um, so yeah, um, but still, if you would have some farm, if you would have some piece of land, you would be able to survive. So my grandfather's land, my grand my grandfather grandparents' farm. Uh, we transformed into the farm actually this piece of land and there was a cow so I think cow is a holy animal because zero investment and every day you have a milk and cheese and butter and the lesson I learned from the war um, uh, land is real uh, source of, of uh, stability because all the people who used to live in buildings no, uh, in, in apartments and in downtown no matter how much money they had on their account, suddenly they were not able to access their money. And even if they would have some cash, they would not be able to buy anything because there was no food or food items to buy on the market. So eventually you would have to turn to the land and start growing your, your own things. And people who had land, they were lucky. So that was important lesson for me um, and for my future planning of my investments. So the war in Bosnia, and I'm just reading questions here, is not the reason why Bosnia is called now Bosnia and Herzegovina. It was always called Bosnia and Herzegovina, at least since mid-19th century. Uh, it's, it's one country, it just has two different regions, let's say. Herzegovina is more south, uh, Mediterranean type of uh, uh, climate, and Bosnia is more continental. Um, I don't understand how did you manage to escape Trivun? Uh, what is Trivun? Uh, so what inspired me to work with uh, war-torn children as opposed to trying to get away from it? Because there was, an, I had amazing teacher. Imagine it, so during the war there was no electricity, no light, there were no books. Uh, to study from so everything I had only candles back home and then what we had is this amazing teacher who used to make amazing things out of nothing out of very limited resources uh, teaching aids she was engaging us she was talking about the importance of education but not just the talking she was managed to do it somehow that even though there were sirens every day every second day we kids, we enjoyed going to school and we wanted to go to school um, despite what was going around us because she was really amazing. And I believe, uh, so in that period, as I said at the beginning, uh, there were before war, there were a bunch of us uh, kids from my neighborhood going to the same classrooms. But then in a few weeks, I was the only one going to the school. So I became extremely social. I was just spending time with my grandparents on the farm and like playing with myself and that teacher and other kids in the classroom, she really managed to help us to deal with these war traumas that at, at that time we were not aware of what's happening around us. And after the war finished, I thought that war situation is a normal situation because we almost my generation, we forgot how it's like to live without sirens, without bombings, without only bad news on the TV. So probably thanks to this teacher and what she did for me and how she managed to transform my life and managed somehow to bring sense of normality during this war period, I decided to work with the children in conflict, post-conflict situations. Um, so how did I feel seeing all these things being destroyed and the pain people were going through? I, as I said, I was a child and as a child, you grew up in this situation and you are not aware what's happening around you. So I was not directly exposed to the uh, killing scenes. Uh, so I thought shortage of food is a normal thing. Eating same things for weeks is a normal thing. Uh, I forgot what does it mean to have chocolate, sweets, and I thought everything was homemade. Uh, uh, can you hear me now? Because the connection just uh, is broken. Okay, 
So, um, oh, there are so many questions now here. Um, so, uh, what are the biggest things you learned during this period? As I said, the importance of land, owing something, owing land, which because that helps you to survive and you're not dependent on economy and um, on the current situation that's happening in your country. And the second thing, which was obviously very important in my life, the importance of education. Uh, those are maybe two uh, most important lessons that I learned during the war period. Uh, so this is uh, so um, I do see some similarities now with the Syrian refugees that live in the camp again I, I was not living in a camp so it's a different environment it's a different climate even the camps they look totally different from uh, where I used to live during the war period and uh, you cannot see destruction here in Jordan uh, they live in a safe environment, um, conditionally safe environment. So it's a kind of difficult to um, draw parallel from what you can see, but from what you can observe from people's behavior, I can draw some parallels. And that's uh, losing hope in the future, uh, especially older generation. Um, because they less and less they see themselves as um, going back to Syria to their homes, and children they it's already fifth year that some of them live in these refugee camps. So for them this is a normal uh, lifestyle. Just a few weeks ago we took high school students uh, to one uh, uh, to a field trip to one national park here, and on the way to the park we stopped at the university. So for most of them, it was the first time to leave the camp. And then at the universities, they were taking photos of everything, everything, everything. And the biggest attraction for them at the university was the uh, elevator. So they were impressed by the elevator because they are missing these small things that are normal to us in their life. Uh, there was a one teacher, she's actually a psychologist, Syrian refugee psychologist working in the camps. And she told me, um, Daniel, you know what is my biggest dream? And I asked her what? To see green trees again. Because there are no camps, it's, uh, there are no trees, there is no, nothing green is here because it's in the middle of the, in the desert. Um, so these small things, you know, that are really affecting people's lives here, here uh, because you live in a closed environment and everything is pretty much artificial. So uh, there is a question, what is your university experience like must have been such a culture shock? So not really. Um, I was traveling extensively. So uh, and Bosnia used to be part of Ottoman Empire for four centuries. And our cuisine, some cultural parts are similar to Oriental lifestyle. So I don't feel these big differences and culture shocks living here. Uh, I again uh, think that university, no matter which degree you take, will not prepare you for the real job experience in a humanitarian field. Uh, all the theories that I learned, they are not applicable here, or at least they fail to be applicable and you don't look at them in the same way or you don't think of them about them in the same way when you're faced with these refugees, uh, when you live in this emergency situation that you just read about and, and theorize about. Um, so any big, uh, how was my one young world experience? Um, it was interesting. Uh, it was most powerful during these few days that it was happening because I had the audience, I had the means to spread the message that I wanted to spread. But then uh, what happened afterwards, it was not so much productive, at least not for me. Um, I think there needs to be ways uh, to keep the One Young World community more engaged in what's happening after the summit. 
uh, not just through emails, not just through sending updates, what we are doing uh, in our uh, jobs. So I s see some room for improvement here, but definitely it was very useful for me. And after that event, um, I was contacted by so many people, by so many volunteers worldwide who were willing to donate something, to spend some time in the camp, to work with the refugees. So that is really beneficial and I'm really happy for having this chance. Uh, so when I go back, so there is a question, do you go back to Bosnia and still feel the effects of war? How would you say if, if has, it has affected you to these days? Uh, so I do, when you go back to Bosnia, pretty much is everything is the same, at least in the capital city, uh, as in other Central European, Southeast European uh, capitals. So you cannot see so much difference, but living there and knowing people there, being educated there, growing up there, there is a division in people's heads, in people's minds. Um, still segregated across national and religious line, and these borders, uh, sad to say, but they are not, they haven't blurred out during this period after the war. Uh, what I enjoy most about working with young Syrians inside the camp, uh, actually, I don't work inside the camp. My office, I'm an education program manager. So, uh, can you hear me now? There was again a problem with the connection. Can you hear me? Okay, so you can hear me. So, um, what I so I don't work directly inside the camps because uh, my office is in Amman, in the capital city, and that's boring part of the humanitarian work. Uh, so I try to go as much as possible to the camp to see how my team is doing there. And then when I go there for business purposes, for job related purposes, to see the implementation of our projects, you have to talk to these people there. And then, you know, the longer you stay, the more affected you become. And uh, I've seen these changes. With me, I became much more emotional. Um, I react to things much more um, emotionally than I used to react before, and that's all this stress and 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 uh, uh, effect which every humanitarian probably experiences in working in these uh, environments. But you know, it really gives me personal satisfaction when there is a child coming, uh, running in the center, and he says "Mudir, Mudir," which means manager teacher uh thank you for giving me pencil i mean i didn't give him a pencil there is a huge procurement and uh logistics beyond that but they see me as somebody who is helping them to get the education so i'm really happy when i see these small moments when we organize events celebration of international days and when they have a chance to dance to play to act and and get somehow a sense of normal life inside the camp. Um, how many languages do I speak? Unfortunately, I'm not talented for languages. English is my first foreign language. German is the second, but I don't use German so much. Uh, and then because I always put in my CV Serbian, Bosnian, Croatian and Montenegrin, but basically it's the same language. The difference is like British English, American English. But because we were in war, these countries, we have new countries with new names, so we have to have new languages, because that's an important part of our national identity, which I think it's all stupid altogether. So it's all one language, English is a second language, and German a little bit. Um, what do I think causes the biggest conflict between people? So it depends on which, conf which conflict we are talking about. So these political conflicts here, um, they are very complex conflicts and there are many parties involved here. Uh, uh, concretely in Syria, the conflict started because there was a certain part of population which was not happy with the government, with the way their government was running the country. So they decided to, um, to protest against the government which escalated in the war and then it became very complex. 
from what I've seen in Bosnia, as what I said at the beginning, uh, playing with people's emotions and identities. Identity is a very powerful thing. We all have multiple identities, sexual, religious identity, school identity, city identity, country identity. Um, and very often we are not aware how these identities are very important. And some m media and politicians so media and politicians and certain group of people are very successful in in playing with these identities, which can lead them to the war. Um, how do you get onto the path of education and working with refugee? Is there any advice you would give anyone who intends to follow the path of education on an international level? You need to be passionate about this. You need to have something, some battery inside you that is uh, pushing you to work as a humanitarian. If there is no battery, it the power will you, will uh, disappear very soon and then nothing uh, you, you will not be able to achieve anything. It's a really challenging job. It's more challenging for the people coming from developed countries, from Western countries, because uh, still uh, many of, and I see this by volunteers that we have there, they think coming here spending two weeks playing football with kids taking photos is a humanitarian no no it's not uh it's much more than that and you are not prepared for this you cannot be prepared for this so uh you just need to have passion you need to have motivation and you need to have some reason inside you why do you want to help other people and all of us we have personal story behind uh mine was war in bosnia so you need to know what your reason is for helping other people is it just a summer internship, which is good on your CV, or it's you really see yourself as your life call of helping other people? Is there any way we can get in contact with young Syrians? Well, it really depends which contact you're thinking about and what would you like to do with these Syrians if you're thinking about volunteering. Uh, Many NGOs, they accept volunteers, including uh, Relief International NGO for which I'm currently working for. But uh, be prepared to invest signif significant amount of time here, meaning at least to stay three months, because it's a huge logistic burden and it's not very effective if you're staying for a shorter period. Uh, so just Google, find NGOs and then just drop email presenting yourself. Uh, what are your skills and how you can contribute uh, to uh, Syrian refugees. Uh, being an educational project person, you must see so much talent in these young people, right? Uh, yeah, there is so much talent there, but it's so difficult to notice this talent and then to manage this talent. Uh, there are huge traditional uh, differences here and challenges that we face. Uh, tal talent is not does not necessarily here mean something positive like it's in uh, Western countries. Uh, there are certain set of values uh, that are more appreciated than being creative, innovating, proposing different solutions, thinking out of a box. Um, so when we notice the talent it's usually through established means like drama plays and then you'll find amazing actors there amazing drawings that these kids uh make uh, so yeah there is a lot of talent and what we are trying to start now is social innovation we have seven locations inside two uh refugee camps called social innovation labs and we are trying for the youth to identify local problems that they face in the uh, refugee camps and then with the help of us and the UNICEF who is our major donor uh, to come up with the creative solutions so we will see how does this work this is exactly to help uh, kids to develop their talents and those ones who who uh, those talents that we identify to um, export this these talents and to make them beneficial to everybody has there ever, ever been a particular emotional moment working with them that almost made you break down a particular instance? Uh, yeah, as I told you, this moment where this teacher told me. Uh, uh, for some period, and up until now, for the last uh, 
nine months we don't have internet uh, connection inside the camp so and and one interesting fact about refugees so even if they don't have something to eat they all have smartphones because smartphone is their only connection with the family who remained in Syria or they live in other parts of the world so smartphone for them is the most important tool so uh, once there was English teacher in one camp and he stopped me started crying saying that he will resign and he's the best teacher we have uh, and I asked him why do you want to resign he said it's been three months that I don't know what's happening with my family if they are still alive or dead and I cannot live like this so I will leave the camp and I will go back to Syria and I'm ready to die rather to stay here and not knowing what's happening with my family so you know and how can I expect him to teach these kids when the only thing he's thinking about is his family so that's maybe one example I can think of right now. How vital is it we get education out in third world countries and how can we do a better job of getting this out? I'm not sure I understand this question. If you can just maybe um, ask the same question in a more detailed way. How important do you think is it, it is not to forget where you come from? Uh, for me, where I come from, I think people who are proud to be Germans, proud to be Egyptians, proud to be Bosnians, are very limited people. Because there is nothing to be proud there. You didn't choose the country that you will be born in. I was born in Yugoslavia, and now my country is Bosnia. And people who limit themselves in the borders of their countries, they are just limited people. So, being proud or be... <laughs> Uh, that's important for me where I come from no it's not uh, it's important these memories that I have for me my family and my friends who still live in Bosnia they are important one but where I come from I don't live there for a few years now and probably I will not live there for many years to come so that's the uh, one of the identities I'm talking about all the identities are constructed and it's very good if we are aware of our identities and try to deconstruct them we will then live in a much better world and we will get to know us better from identities that are inherited to identities which we want to construct about ourselves. Uh, whom would I like to reach out to and what would you say they need out there? Uh, London conference members. So uh, this year there was in February there was a London conference, which is an um, event in which uh, international governments and donors they meet at one place and then they decide how much uh, money they will um, um, invest in the in the addressing Syrian uh, conflict. So. Uh, the pledges were huge, promises were huge, but still Jordan is not seeing money coming in. So if I would reach out to somebody, I would reach out to these people. Please do what you promised. That's that will make our life and and work in a, in a hosting country, host countries much easier. But of course, everything we do, we are doing with the hope that soon the war in Syria will stop and that these people will be able to go back to their uh, country. Uh, because nobody wants to leave the country and the place you're used to uh, live unless you have to. Uh, but the problem with some of the people is uh, those people who sold their land in Syria, they most likely will never go back to Syria. Um, war has different effects on many people. Did you see people go down a bad path as a result of the war? Yeah, sure. We have many problems inside the camp, usually trauma. And many people don't know how to deal with this trauma, even though there are uh, there is a professional support and we are trying to reach out to as many as possible people. But then you would see uh, drug consumption, consumption um, in places in which this was not the case before. Uh, learning difficulties due to trauma. Uh, prostitution uh, in some cases. Uh, dropping out of school and then child labor so yeah how do you feel we can use uh, technology to better solutions for them 
Oh, I think this is a question from developed country. It's really difficult. Uh, there are limited uh, resources here, no internet connection, no electricity. Uh, so unless by technology we mean something that doesn't require this electricity. Uh, so that's a question I was contemplating about for a long period and I still think in this setting use of technology is very limited and we can and they are we can achieve some significant results with the use of other tools than technology which requires electricity or internet um, will I be attending one young world in Canada this year to share I was not thinking about this but who knows maybe I will change my mind um, but yeah, so far I'm not thinking, I don't think I will attend summit in uh, Canada. In regards to the question, education is powerful, how can we spread it even further? Ah, yeah, okay, so that was the question. So the, the problem is not education. Most of the people nowadays have access to education. But what they don't have to, and I'm talking about 260 million children who are going to school, but they fail to achieve the basic literacy and numeracy. Which means, you as a taxpayers, you pay money to your governments, who is then donating this money to uh, developing countries and other places to get these kids in the school. But once when they have, when we have them in the school, they are not learning. So for me, the bigger problem is quality of education. What do we offer them once when they are in the school? And that's really big question. For me, teachers are the most important. But then after teachers, there is a learning teaching material. Uh, environment. Uh, so these three elements together then and curriculum would give uh, a good quality education. So I believe all of us, you, you hear this sentence so often, you know, education is important, education is important, but why is it important? Why do you have to go to school? Your grandma can teach you something. So uh, there needs to be, uh, this is a global effort. There needs to be international uh, factors and actors who would push for access to education and uh, providing quality education. Have you experienced discrimination, racism doing what you do? No, actually, I do look like Middle Eastern. So whenever they see me here, they think I'm uh, from this region. Uh, usually they think I'm Iraqi. Uh, so no, no racism. Racism is a not issue here, historically here, and, and um, the same is in Bosnia. There is no racism. There is nationalism. Um, so racism is issue in other countries. Um, so no discrimination so far. They are so friendly, these people, and it's, it's, it's part of a culture that guests are very important. So no matter where you go, if you're a foreigner or just a person whom they don't know, they would behave with you 10 times better than with their family members. Because there is this culture of um, um, having guests, perceiving guests as very important uh, person. When you are next in the UK, how is it where you are staying? I'm staying in the UK, probably I will be in uh, mid of November attending uh, one conference. Uh, just for a few days uh, and I'm staying in uh, Jordan in uh, Amman so it's quite nice here um, it was it's a very dry country but not that hot as I expected and uh, there are many expats here uh, different refugees from surrounding countries uh, so it's a quite diverse country and I was really uh, positively surprised how liberal this country is uh, having uh, prejudices before coming here being somebody from Europe I found out that many of these prejudices were based on, on, on just misinformation so it's a very liberal country and I learned a lot here so whoever is thinking to come to Jordan feel free it's a very safe country the safest one in the region and a quite open country so uh, do you think it's vital we reach out to politicians to get more involved? Yeah, I think politicians are very important here, but um, politicians will not act just because they want to help. They will probably be pushed by their constituency. So it's common people who 
are voting for these politicians and who have means to force politicians to bring policies. So if there is a general mood, general attitude, general support, like we've seen in Europe when the refugees were coming, it was not politicians who were opening their hands, it was citizens of the country, and then the citizens were forcing their politicians to adopt new policies, modify and bring new policies. And I think Germany is a very good case for that. Um, so yeah, we need to reach and to uh, to common people and to to reach out uh, to use media actually to reach to common people. So not just pictures of the war uh, that is in Syria that we see every day in on TV, but also but also how the deep live, how these people who are affected by the war live, both in host communities, host countries in Europe, in the region. And then I think. Uh, Uh, what final words would you have to say to people? What message can you share? Uh, try to do what you can do on your personal level. So, if you're if, if you're university students, try to um, do some awareness raising activities. Um, uh, bring refugees to your home if you have one flat that you're uh, one floor that you're not using. Uh, play football with them or other games in the park when you see them in the park. Uh, take your family uh, to socialize with these people. Learn Arabic so that you can interact with these people. So do do something that you can do on your personal individual level. Don't expect governments to do something. Don't expect UN to do something. Do what you can do. And if you are doing what you can do and if all of us are doing what we can do, there will be no war. Not just that we will solve the crisis here, but there will be no war. So I'm quite optimist still, positive person, I don't see everything being dark um, and I think there just needs to be more activism. Uh, there is a hope for the future, uh, can this war come to an end and soon hopefully, be, uh, yeah the war will get to an end, when we don't know, but the problem is you know war does not just mean uh, shooting, there will be huge division in Syria uh, after the war ends officially. Uh, so how do we reconstruct the country? That's going to be a bigger issue. As I see that in Bosnia there is no war, but as I said, people are still divided in their heads. Um, can we, uh, the ones trying to make change, honestly make the change needed? Yeah, we can. Uh, depends how you look at this change. You cannot stop the war in Syria as an individual. But I, as an individual, I am giving, okay, this is my job to work as education program manager, but there is so much additional effort I put in what I'm doing in order to bring some change. I'm working weekends, I'm working extra hours. I do interact with these people and that's uh, not part of my job requirement. And this additional effort that I'm putting, other than what I'm doing as my official job, I believe it's bringing change. Uh, so yeah, if there are no more questions, or if there are questions, uh, I don't know if, if there is a way to leave my uh, Skype or email so that you can ask further questions. But please bear in mind that we are very busy here, so I might not respond immediately or um, try to have really concrete questions or some suggestions, some proposals. Uh, so my uh, email is, um, okay, I will write it down. It's d dot c u t u r i c at gmail.
Shy Guys von Sweden. Ich kann es wirklich sehen. 